just take a quick moment this morning to update us. Um, as you know, uh, we have been looking for a facility for a long time. And uh, for, for this entire year now, now we've been actively looking. Michelle is our uh, local real estate. Let's give her a hand, realtor. Uh, she is actively looking for us a place to go. We're all on the lookout. We drive around and we look and think that would be a cool church or that would be a cool church. So we're actively looking. We're still looking. Every week we have a conversation about it. Michelle is probably tired of me blowing up her phone. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm very, we're still looking. I want to also put in your wheelhouse this morning. Continue to pray. Continue to push through. Now, many of us have our phone alarm set at 8 p.m. If you don't have your phone alarm set at 8 p.m. to pray for our church, please do so. Uh, we're going to have a really cool campaign coming up really soon uh, to, to remind us to pray for a building. And so I just want to update you on where we stand with that. But we're still looking for a place. We're still in progress. We, we haven't given up. Please don't give up on us. And so continue to pray. But last week, Last week, we started a brand new series called At the Table. At the Table. At the Table is a series that uh, we look about meals that they had in the Bible. What great things happened over a table? What great things happened over a meal? And there's several of them. And I don't think we're going to get to all of them in this month, but I'm really excited about what's going on. But At the Table is, is one of these things where it's the whole concept of when you go home, and you sit at the table at a meal with your family, the conversations you have. It, 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 TV doesn't take the place of conversations. The wisdom that you get from the table can't be put in by uh, entertainment or television. And I don't want the recliner to take the place at the, of the head of the table. It's good to surround yourself at the table. And this is a biblical concept. But last week, I and Skylar and Jermaine enjoyed a great bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit. Uh, here, if you missed that, man, you missed a good breakfast, but you weren't invited. Um, but this table, this table, everybody can recognize. If you've been in church any time or you've been a part of a church, you know what this is. What is this? It's a communion table. And we look at it in, in our circumstance, in our situation, in the church life, if you call it, as holy. This is a holy thing. Now... It could be meant to be traditional. It can be put in the category of this is what traditions we do and, and all these things. But it's a special meal. It's a special. Everybody say special. special. It's a special meal. Special meals to me are like Thanksgiving. That's special to me. You know why? Because there's mac and cheese and Mamaw fixes it. Amen. <laughs> Everybody give a hand for Mamaw for mac and cheese. Y'all give a hand for anything I ask you to give a hand for. You just feel bad because I ask you to give me a hand, and then they're like, what if I don't want to? What if you don't like mac and cheese? Anyway, mac and cheese is probably the best thing on the table there ever was. Okay, mac and cheese is one of my favorite foods. That's a special meal to me. All right, I was at the Thomason wedding a couple months ago, and, and Mike's grandma fixed mac and cheese, and that was worth it. I'm just letting you know, man. Tell her I said thank you. <laughs> It's awesome. Special occasion. Weddings, they're a special occasion. It's a special time. Christmas dinner, man, that's just a special occasion. Why? Because, like, if you're a part of our family, you eat and then there's presents, okay? That's a special time. And, and don't ever, you know, they, so many people say it's better to give than receive, but you know you like receiving it. You like receiving a gift. Don't, don't, don't be so humble as to think you don't like receiving Oh, it's better to give and receive. What is this? <gasps> Thank you. All right? It's a special time. Everyone say special. special. Let's keep it, let's keep it in, the, in the lanes, Brian. Let's keep it in the lanes. Today we're going to talk about one of the most special meals that ever was, and that's the Last Supper. Everyone say Last Supper. Or the Lord's Supper, wherever you grew up. You know, if you grew up on the South Side, that's the Lord's Supper. You know, if you grew up down here, it's the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. It's the, it's the one Jesus was at, okay? <laughs> so if you have your Bible, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to start in verse 26. Now listen, we remember the Gospels of Jesus Christ are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are these? These are these men's account of the story. These are in their own words... This is what happened. These are these people's accounts of what happened. Now, you, four of you may go out and give a different story. Not to say it's a lie, but it's a different way of telling it. 
then what happened at church today? That's exactly what the Gospels are. They're these men's accounts of what happened. Matthew was there. John was there. All these people were there and, and looking at what happened during this one meal. Now imagine this. Imagine you're sitting at the table with Jesus and you have no idea what happens past this point. All you're knowing is that you are at a meal. Let's look at it. Matthew 26, 26. And, they were, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink it, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many of the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, understand what happened here. This was a meal. And Jesus, all of a sudden, he, he announces, it's like when you would come to church today, and I would all of a sudden announce, hey, listen, this is the last, uh, this is the last message I'm ever going to preach. If I was to stand up to you and say, this, pray, I'll just pray that it's not. But I pray that, that God, God says, or Jesus says, listen, this is the last meal I'm ever going to have with you. Wouldn't that surprise you? You'd be a little shocked. Like, what? Uh, we were just having a meal. We were just eating. And Jesus says, no, this is the last one. We have to look at it in, this, in those terms. <laughs> Here we have one of the greatest meals that was ever eaten. Because of who the host was. It was Jesus Christ. Here he tells us that this meal is a representation of what's to come. This meal is a representation. This is what's going to happen in my life of what's to come. Now for many of us we know this story. And we know it's called the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. But most important question I think that we always wonder but fail to ask is why? Why? Why was this a representation of his blood and his body? What is the big deal about some bread and some wine? What was the big deal about this supper? Now, there makes no mention of any other food there. He just took some bread. He just picked it up off the table and broke it. And he picked up a cup and he took it off the table and said, Look, this represents me. But we always, in, in a church setting, we always just say okay to this. Why? Because this is a tradition. This is where we've, I've known this all my entire life. I cannot ever remember not knowing about communion. And this communion thing goes, it, it stretches across uh, uh, denominations. It stretches across, in, in the Christian world, if you read this Bible right here, it says communion equals Jesus. No matter what denomination you believe in or whatever you breathe, if you read this, it says communion equals Jesus. But my question today, and the more I look into this, the more I got flabbergasted and bumfuzzled and all those other 12th grade words, is why? Why this? Why did he take a piece of bread and a cup? Now we know it says to remember me. Well, it's to remember me, but... Why? What's the big deal about the bread? Why wasn't a piece of turkey? Why wasn't it a, a, a vegetable? Why was it's bread and it's the cup? Why is it? The meal is so special to Jesus because of what it represents. And the more you dive into this, you more you start to understand. I want to explain today to you the meal and the bread and the cup and why they're so important to us. Again, Aaron probably, I probably got on Aaron's nerve talking about this all week. And you know what else it says? And she's like, I'm just going to listen to it. You don't have to preach it at home. I'm not going to get into whether the wine was alcoholic or whether it wasn't, whether the bread was square or whether it was round. That's not relevant. What is relevant is what it, is what it represents. Today we have juice, okay? Nobody's getting toe up in here. <laughs> Why do we do this? Why is it that we do this? To understand why we have to uphold this tradition, we must understand why it took place. What was it to represent? Why were they e even eating in the first place? It wasn't just a supper. 
It was the Passover meal. Everyone say Passover. Passover. Passover meal. Let's look at Mark's version of this story for a moment. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, which is the Passover meal, when they killed the Passover lamb, everyone say lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he said to two of his disciples, and he said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him wherever he goes and, and say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there, make ready for us. So listen, you have to understand. Remember, Jesus and his men were Jewish. They, they understood the Jewish laws. They was under the law of Moses. This, these were Jewish men. And so the Passover meal, the meal of unleavened bread, is a Jewish holiday. It's an Independence Day, if you will. Let's take it all the way back to Moses' day. Let's get our mindset on that. We got Jesus, now we got Moses. Let's go back in time for a moment. And so we see Moses, and he's trying to free the people of uh, uh, the Israelites from Egypt's grasp. And he brings them all these... All these things, it's like locusts and all these plagues and everything like that. And the final plague, he says, he says, listen, if you don't let my people go, there's going to be something so tragic happen to you, it's not going to be funny. I'm paraphrasing. And so he says, listen, there's going to be an angel of death come. And so he tells, Moses tells all of his people to get ready because you, what you need to do is kill an unblemished lamb. A lamb so pure, it's unblemished. There's no spots, no nothing on the lamb. And you need to kill this lamb, and you need to take the blood and put it on the door frame. And that's a sign to the angel of death to pass over house. Well, what was the consequence? The consequence was the firstborn, the firstborn of every, everybody say firstborn, of every family would die. The firstborn. And that was it. And that's what happened. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the one who wouldn't let him go, is holding his dead son in his arms and saying, you can get out of my country now. And so all of a sudden, this, these whole, all these people said, oh, he's letting us go. Let's, let's go. And so they pack up what they can. And they get what they can. And they didn't get everything, but they got what they could. And they left. And they're out and they're gone. This was the Passover. It's so important that we understand why Jesus was eating a Passover meal at this time to understand this table. So, what is it about communion? There's two things we've been talking about all the whole time I've been talking. Number one is the bread. Number one, the bread. The first element we'll look at today is the bread. What's so important about the bread? It's one of the two elements found in communion service. Oftentimes we represent it as a cracker, but it was unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. That's a fancy word to say there's no yeast in it. Everybody say no yeast. No yeast. There's no yeast in it. Any baker will tell you that you need yeast to make it what? To rise up, to puff up. If you have no yeast, your stuff is flat. So what happened during the Passover time? Is that as the Egyptian or as the Israelites were getting out of Egypt, they all of all those thousands of people forgot the yeast. Okay, I don't know why. All those thousands of people forgot the yeast and all this, and they got in the desert and they go, "Who forgot the yeast? Joe? Was it you? We we don't have any yeast, so we're just going to break this flat bread." The Bible represents yeast as something very horrible and very bad for us. When you have yeast, all you need, all the bakers know, all, all the mamas in the house know that you just need a little bit of yeast, just a little bit to make that thing grow, make it pop out and puff up and like a muffin. Y'all know what I'm saying? Oh my, muffins, chocolate one. It makes it puff. I want you to understand something about yeast today and what the Bible says about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6, your glorifying is not good. You do not know what little leaven leavens the whole lump. 
Therefore purge out the old leaven, which is the yeast, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What this verse represents is leaven as sin. It's the sin in your life. It's the stuff that makes you puff up and you think, well, I, I, I'm, I'm good. I don't need God. I don't need church. I don't need this stuff. And it's all this sin in your life. And so all of a sudden you're puffed up. But unleavened bread, the bread with no yeast is pure. No leaven, no sin. In a spiritual sense of the way, if we add yeast into our spirit, it is represented as malice and wickedness. And it only takes a little bit. Do you ever notice when you're tempted, you're not tempted to do something so crazy at first. You're only tempted just a little. And just a little bit. Just a little bit will ruin the whole batch. Everyone ever hear the, the bad apple that ruins the whole batch? You have one bad. That's what happens. It's true. It's a spiritual thing. God did these things on purpose so we, I could preach about them. <laughs> just a little bit. It just takes a little bit of sin to start a whole batch of a sinful life. What this scripture is saying, that yeast or leaven as they call it, is a representation of where we are before Christ. Or where we can get to when we forget about the words that God has in our hearts. Or where we can get to if we don't keep our minds sharp and our spirits sharp with this word. It's where we can go. It takes the yeast out. It's a very hard process. You cannot take yeast out of bread. You can't do it. Once it's baked in there, you can't do it. Jesus is the only thing that can surgically remove the sin in your life. Nothing else will do it. No job, no person, no place, no thing will take away the things that you've done in your life. You can't run from it. You can't, no matter how hard you run from God, you cannot run from it. But if when you stop and turn around and say, Jesus, would you take this away from me? He, he then removes it. The bread is a representation of the sinless life that Christ is given as a sacrifice. I'll say that again. The bread is a representation of a sinless life of Christ given as a sacrifice. John chapter 6 verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Isn't that something? Isn't that something how God's word seems to tie all in together? Even before this meal took place, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So when you pick up this cracker, I'm going to grab one. When you pick up this cracker, it's not just a, a cracker. It's a representation of the bread of life. Jesus Christ. And we know this and we've talked about this, but this is why. Because this has no yeast in it. It has no sin in it. Jesus' life had no sin. It was unleavened. It was, it was not puffed up. It was not spotted. Which brings me to the second element, number two, the cup. You see, the only way we're saved is by the blood of Jesus Christ. No one wants to talk about the blood of Christ. Why? Well, to be honest with you, blood freaks me out. I don't like my own blood. I don't like your blood. I don't like the dog's blood, okay? The dog had a tick on it the other day. I didn't like it, all right? Gross me out. Much love to the medical professionals in the audience. Thank you so much for being that who you are. I don't like blood. But Jesus gave his blood. His blood was shed for our sins. His blood covered us. And without that blood... Without that blood, we have no remission of sins. There is nothing covering us. There is no covering without the blood. And Jesus knew this. The Bible likens death for a Christ follower as falling asleep. And then you wake up in heaven. You wake up with Christ. 
That's, that, well, that's what it's likened to. And I'm excited about that. But I can't wake up in heaven one day without the blood of Christ knowing He covered my sins. So Jesus knew this. He knew that there was, He was preparing Himself for the Passover that would meet and surpass all needs. Remember the Passover. The Passover. The sacrifice that they killed a spotless lamb. You see how it all ties together. They said, look, kill a spotless lamb, no, no faults, no nothing about it, and take and rub that blood all over your door. And, and then the angel of death will pass over you. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Except a door. He spread it on a cross. And he put his blood on the cross. And this is our door. And this is our way in. You have to talk about the blood and you have to talk about the cross. It's our doorway into salvation. It has to be covered. Why is there a blood sacrifice? Why is there must be a blood sacrifice? Well, let's talk about Old Covenant versus New Covenant. The Old Covenant is when God gave Moses these Ten Commandments and all these laws. And He says, this is how I want my people to live. This is how I want it done. And they never said, okay, why God? Why do you want it done this way? They never said that. They said, yes, sir. What's the difference between us and, and our rebellious heart and our rebellious spirit? Sometimes we ask God, why? I ask God, why? Why do we do this? And he says, I'll show you why. Because there has to be a blood sacrifice. There has to be a sacrifice for sin. And these are the laws of God. And so what they would do from then on, they would kill a spotless lamb. They would kill a spotless lamb. And they, they would have the blood on the altar. And this is the altar. From now on, since the Son of God has died and shed His blood and broken His body, that covers us. We no longer have to kill these animals. We no longer have to do all these things. It's covered. All we have to do is believe. And man, isn't that the mountain for so many people? Isn't that the hardest thing to get over? Isn't that the hardest thing to invest in? That you have to believe. Everything is built on belief and faith when it comes down to Christ. Do you believe? Jesus knew all of this. Remember, let's go back to the Passover again. What did, what did God say He would take away from everyone who didn't have the blood on the door? He said they'd take away the firstborn son. Isn't that what got taken away from us? God's firstborn. God's only son. He was taken and He died for us. A spotless lamb that shed the blood, that covered us for all of our sins. Now, going back to the Last Supper, Jesus holds the cup and he, in His hands and He says, drink this cup. And then He holds the bread and He said, eat this bread. Now, Jesus is not saying here, drink my blood. That's not what He's saying. That's gross. <laughs> he's saying this is a representation of the covering of your sins. This is the blood on the door. This tells the angel of death to pass over you and it writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. And so when, when it's all said and done, your name's there and he says, come on in, you're on the list. You're on the list. Why? Not because of what you did. If it was because of what we did, we'd be out. It's because somebody says, my friend is coming soon. Will you write their name on the list? Yes, sir, I sure will. He's the owner of the, of the place and he's just going to, okay. I've I seen my friend down here and he loves me and he accepts me. She accepts me. He believes. She believes. Write his name. Write her name down. And man, there's going to be a celebration like no other. The Last Supper, he tells his guys, he says, listen guys, I'm not going to be here much longer. In fact, tonight, I'm not going to be here much longer. This is before Judas broke up the band. That fell flat. <laughs> but listen, not only do we see, receive salvation and liberty from His blood, but we receive healing 
in His name. Because the Bible says, by His stripes we are healed. We receive so much than just salvation. We receive a life and a life more abundant. Are we seeking that abundant life? Are we just going through the motions because this is what we do here? If no one knew what this was truly about, then we'd never do it again. There's no point in going through a tradition. I don't like traditions. I like the things that I like, but I don't like saying why. We're just going to do this because we do it. Let's, let's learn why. We receive salvation. We receive liberty. We receive healing. We receive life. We have looked at the book of Matthew and we looked at the book of Mark. Now, let's look at Luke's version. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this. And divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Simply put, this means this was Jesus' last meal this side of heaven. He no longer needed to refuel his body with earthly substance. In fact, this was a sign that he would give everything for his people. Let's have our singers come back up and the band come back up. There's an old song. Many of us know it. Many of you have been in church for a long time. Called The Old Rugged Cross. And there's a verse in that song. And it goes like this. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to pardon and sanctify me. This is why we do communion. Because this bread, which is represented as unleavened bread, bread with no yeast, bread with no sin, a life with no sin, and the blood as the cup from a spotless lamb that covered our sins, This is why we do what we do. There's a reason. Let's have our ushers come. And let's all stand.